Hey everybody, it's Allie and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, August 10th, 2014. Woo! <laughs> sparks are flying, or they're gonna fly. <laughs> Probably more sparks will be flying next week. I think that next week is going to be all about Neil, and I'm really excited about it. Um, but I think I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off talking about that. <laughs> I think I'll wait till the end to get to that dirt. Let's start out with where YNR started this week. At the beginning of the week, Stitch is having a celebratory lunch with the chief of staff and the doctor boss is Leslie's husband is giving Stitch all of these accolades telling him oh what a great doctor it is and what a great addition he's gonna make uh, to the hospital and he's brought nothing but honor <laughs> to the hospital <laughs> when Billy shows up right in the middle of all of this with the folder of doom. <laughs> he is holding the folder of doom like the sword of Damocles over Stitch's head. It has all of the ways that Stitch has falsified his identity, everything from his military service to his medical schooling, everything. Stitch is not who he says he is and Billy's gonna blow it up. He wants everybody in the world to know. I kind of felt like maybe Stitch was on the verge of telling the hospital anyway. I, I don't think it was just out of the goodness of his heart or the need to confess. I think Stitch probably felt that the walls were closing in and he would have rather preemptively told the information rather than having it come out the way it did publicly. Billy hands over the folder to the doctor and by the way, Nikki and Victor, Victor are standing right there. So it is very public. Um, Billy hands the folder over to the doctor. He takes one look at it like, what is this? I have to read? Tell me what's going on. And Billy, you know, is ready to spill all. Um, Stitch, it's kind of weird. There was this moment where Stitch grabs away the folder and he has this almost animalistic moment where you can tell that he wants to rip it to pieces. This is the only evidence, or this is evidence, of, of a lie that he's perpetrated and now he's holding the evidence in his hand and there's just this brief moment where I, I, I liked it. It was a pause where he had a moral question in front of him. Do I just destroy this right away and then run off into the shadows or do I face what I've done and he does choose to do the right thing. Stitch instead like hands the folder over to his boss and begins to explain the situation, explain why he did what he did. Um, he tried to make the doctor see all of the good that he's done helping people through Genoa City Memorial and throughout his medical career and it's really unfortunately all of the good works that Stitch has has done, including his military service too. It's now becoming washed away by the lie and Stitch realizes he can't go on the way he has been so he tells the um, chief of staff that he is planning to quit at the hospital and the chief of staff is not happy. <laughs> He's not pleased to hear that his star performer is not even who he thought he was and so the um he says the doctor says you know this is gonna have to go before the hospital board it's you know just because you quit doesn't mean that this is all going to go away yes you helped all of these patients but you helped them under fraudulent terms and from a business perspective or from the hospital's perspective, it probably leaves them open to a world of lawsuits. Can you imagine if the public finds out that Genoa City Memorial had a fraudulent doctor or had, you know, I mean, the, once the media gets a hold of this, they can put it out there and it's gonna be a public relations nightmare for the hospital. So there's, there's no way, and 
that, that Stitch is going to be able to keep his job, for one thing, but for another thing, I almost wonder if the hospital is going to choose to keep it under wraps for exactly that reason. I mean, they may very well quietly let him go, but they're probably not going to pub you know make a public statement about it they're probably not going to press charges because it makes them look bad too so the um the chief of staff what the heck is his name leslie's husband i know that i know it and it, I, it escapes me so many characters so many names over the years um but uh yeah he leaves the the athletic club he huffs off and says he's gonna have to present this info to the board Nikki and Victor have to leave. They have to go to Nikki's trial, which we'll talk about next. I guess I shouldn't refer to it as Nikki's trial, but it felt like Nikki was on trial. Uh, Nikki and Victor leave, and there's this moment kind of standing in the ashes and the rubble of what Billy just blew up all around Stitch, where there's a, a, a brief moment alone between Billy and Stitch, and Stitch reminds Billy that he was at the hospital the night that Delia died. Stitch was there. He wanted to help her, and when he found out that she didn't make it, he was devastated, and, you know, it really, I think, made Billy feel guilty. I think he felt guilty. I, I, Billy was so focused in this moment of getting the truth out there and keeping Stitch away from his family that he didn't really think two or three steps down the line. He didn't really consider Stitch as a human being who is now going to have to deal with these repercussions. Um, and, it, you know, it, it, it really kind of made Billy look like, wow, what way to destroy the career of someone who actually cares about people. Stitch's his redemption is already beginning. And, by the way, there was a scene later in the week where Stitch and uh, Chelsea run into one another in the park, and Stitch is obviously upset. He's, he's not Chelsea's number one fan and vice versa. And Chelsea does say, you know, I kind of feel bad uh, that this happened to you, too. I realize that you lost your job over this, and I can't help wondering what that would feel like. You know, I would hate to have the thing that the, the career that I love taken away from me. So everybody kind of feels bad about all of this, including Victoria. But Victoria is now in mission mode. I think she's totally needing to protect herself, needing to protect her child. She doesn't want to deal with any more of this mess between who's the baby daddy, who am I going to end up with, done. It's all about me focusing. In fact, later in the week, she's back at Newman Enterprises, back in 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 Victor's chair. So uh, she has completely shifted her focus. There was a really sad moment there, though, where Victoria goes to the hospital, I guess, for a checkup, I think, and um, Stitch is walking out with his stuff in a box. He's just been removed and uh, from, from the hospital or he quit or whatever. I think they said it was pending board review, but he's on a leave of absence or something. But uh, Stitch and Victoria talk to one another in the hall and he is regretful. She is sad and regretful. But the, the key thing that I noticed in that scene was that Victoria says to Stitch, I can't help but feel like you're holding something back. And that's exactly how I feel. There's definitely more to this story. There's something that he's not telling us. And I'm just wondering, is it that he's covering up for somebody? A little bit of casting news. Meredith Baxter is going to be joining the cast of YNR. I think most people probably know her as the mother from Family Ties. I'm sure she has a, a long history of doing other projects, but I think that's what she's most memorable from. I think that should be pretty interesting. I like her. What I'm not exactly excited about is <laughs> that she is cast as Nikki's drinking buddy. <laughs> she's going to be be throwing them back with Nikki. I'm sure that all of this is going to coincide right with Catherine's 
uh, memorial service. I think that they're going to, uh, Weiner's going to be doing a one year anniversary of Catherine's death memorial service. And I, I laughed because Gary had called into my voicemail earlier in the week and said, I, I hope Nikki doesn't make a fool out of herself at this memorial service, like busting up in there completely drunk with her new buddy. That would be so humiliating. And, but I, I think that's probably exactly what's going to happen. I, I think that should be entertaining, but at the same time, uh, are you guys getting sick of Nikki's constant battle with alcoholism? I know that it's not, it, alcoholism is much like any other addiction in that it's a constant uh, upkeep. It requires you to be constantly aware of it. And I think that if you are a, a, an addict, you're always on the verge of, of, of falling off the wagon. So I don't question that, uh, that uh, the struggle of an alcoholic is very, very real. I just, from a viewing perspective, get really kind of tired of seeing drunk Nikki. It's like, doesn't Melody Thomas Scott ever get tired of getting these scripts every few years where she has to stare longingly at bottles and then order a drink or pour a drink, bring it to her lips only to not, and then the inevitable scene where she takes the first drink and swallows it down. I mean, it's all been seen before, and then she she's crazy on the wagon, and we see her stumbling all over the place, and maybe being a, a, a little uh, disoriented, and maybe even a little mean, and refusing to get help from anyone in the family, and refusing to admit she has a problem and then she will have her miraculous recovery. It's just been there, done that, and I wish that we weren't going there again, but I have no choice. She is clearly really struggling right now. Uh, the verdict is in on Ian's lawsuit, and you know, Ian is so confident that he's gonna win. He actually goes to the coffee house to see Dylan and offers him a piece of the winnings. Says, you know, I'm gonna offer you a piece of the settlement. Really? Uh, uh, that was that, that was very uh, bold for one thing. And Ian knows exactly exactly how Dylan feels about him. He just wants to push him. He just wants to push everybody. Ian knows that he's public enemy number one, that no one really wants him around. I mean, everybody has made that abundantly clear. But he always approaches them all with a victim mentality of an innocence mentality, and it just drives them all crazy. He's found, I think maybe it's the people in Genoa City are used to um, adversaries. They're used to having to fight so hard. And I think what makes Ian a special kind of villain is that he doesn't make you fight real hard. He just lightly taps you, he just tosses something out into the air and lets you deal with it, walks away. <laughs> I do enjoy that man. <laughs> um, at the hearing, the judge I, I was kind of surprised. I, I wasn't expecting what I got. The judge, first of all, was super judgy. <laughs> <laughs> He's perfectly suited for his job because he was real judgmental. He starts telling Nikki essentially how, uh, how horrible it was that she um, you know, didn't, didn't realize who the father of her child was, and then he turns around and tells Ian how disgusted he is with him, and uh, he gets on his high horse and just makes a lot of moral statements about how they're both to blame, which I suppose on some level is true, but the judge ultimately decides to just throw out the case. He's, he dismisses it with prejudice, and I was shocked. Uh, it, it meant, um, you know, basically Ian lost. I was completely expecting him to win. Right before the, uh, the, the hearing, Nikki is standing around, I think, talking to Victor and saying something about how when Ian wins the court case, he's going to have enough money to get a foothold in Genoa City. And I thought, well, there it is. That's what's going to happen. He's going to become rich off of this and he's never going to go away. But he lost and I was surprised. Of course he you know it, it was a it was it was a battle 
lost for Ian, but not a war lost. He was certainly successful in forcing Nikki to drudge up these horrible memories from the past, putting it into public record, public court record. Uh, he was successful in pushing her off the wagon. And she has this moment after the verdict is read and most people have left the courtroom when she just walks up to him and says, you didn't get me. You didn't win. So that was, it was, it was at least, even if Nikki doesn't feel like she's won the war, it was a small victory for her. And then off in the corner with, you know, with, with his lawyer, or I think, I don't know if he was by himself or with his smarmy lawyer, but Ian vows to get revenge, saying that he has one more trick up his sleeve that they'll never see coming. Flash forward to the next day. <laughs> where there's a scandal magazine that's just hit the shelves in the internet and the headline is Nikki Newman's secret sex cult diary well I want to read that article <laughs> that is a good advert that's a good uh, headline right there Nikki Newman's secret sex cult diary <laughs> Was it GC Buzz? Was it was it on GC Buzz? Surely it must have been. Um, I would have clicked that link. <laughs> ah, so the, the the all of the scandalous details of her diary have been published for the world to see and. Everyone immediately knows exactly who did it. They hate him more than ever, as if they couldn't possibly hate Ian Ward more than than they already do. That it, it it escalates a level. Uh, Avery said something. She called him um, a vile, repulsive use of skin. I thought that was a good line. She kind of rolled over it, but I was like, that's a good line. A vile, repulsive. Sack of skin would have been better. That's how I would have pumped that up. But uh, I thought, gosh, I, I, he, he, he's definitely a bad guy. Unless there's any, is there any chance he didn't like it? No, right? I don't, see, I, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll explain in a little bit why I think maybe that wasn't the final trick up his sleeve. Um, but surely he must have been the one to, to leak it. Now, of course, the press <laughs> jumps all over Nikki at the club. Even though Devon has banned the press from the athletic club, uh, they, they, they run in. Nikki's having this sort of play date luncheon with Faith, <laughs> the most innocent Genoa City uh, resident. And the press comes in and they're yelling at her like, tell us about your diet. Tell us about the sex cult. Why did you abandon your child? Why did you leave? You know, why did you get rid of Dylan? And Faith is so innocent and so like, what's going on? What did you abandon Uncle Dylan? Why would you abandon Uncle Dylan? What's a love child? Faith. <laughs> Girl, you better get used to this. <laughs> you are a Newman heir. I know that you are innocent right now, but in five years when you're pregnant and working in Newman Enterprises and dealing with all of the scandal, you're going to look back on this and realize how naive you were. <laughs> you got a whole lifetime of this crap coming ahead of you, girl. <laughs> uh, so, just as this is, uh, I think everybody kind of leaves. Ian's there. I mean, he's the, he walks right up to Nikki's table and is the first one to hand her the magazine. So he gets to see everything blow up right in front of her, her face. Dylan shows up and he and Avery have to take Faith off to calm her down. Uh, Nikki needs to run off and Ian's left behind with his lawyer and he's uh, drunk. He's, uh, he's been drinking at the bar, uh, or that was the impression I got was that he was becoming drunk and is a little slurry and the lawyer says, you know, well, you're, you shouldn't be leaking court documents. That could get us in a whole lot of trouble. And Ian is so indignant at the idea that he could have done that. That's, that's what I like about him. He, he, he sticks to his lie. And I think that's a quality that you would need to have as a cult leader. You have to believe that lie. And that's exactly what he does. He does these horrible things, but then disconnects and uh, like doesn't even acknowledge that he did them. So Nikki runs uh, <clears throat> immediately to Michael to try to get an injunction against the newspaper or the gossip rag so that they can get this article pulled and it's very very intense Lauren is there she it's it, there was an 
a, a nice little connecting moment between Nikki and Lauren where uh, Nikki says, you know, nobody understands what this feels like. And Lauren says, uh, I do. Do you remember when my sex tape got leaked? It was humiliating beyond belief, so I know what you're going through. I kind of wonder if in the future, um, Lauren's going to be stuck in the middle of the Nikki-Christine feud, because it was it was interesting to see Lauren trying to relate to Nikki and comfort her in that moment. Um, they do uh, eventually get an injunction to get the, um, the article pulled, but before they're able to do that, everybody sees it. Nick and Victoria see it. Um, obviously, Dylan and Avery see it. Uh, Nikki's been trying to call Victor and be really strong and, uh, you know, just like, call me when you get a chance. <laughs> I'm sure she'd rather him find out about this from her, not not seeing it on the internet search. <laughs> but everybody is fully aware that this is Ian's doing. So. Uh, Victoria and Nick are in Victor's office talking about, you know, how they just want to get him. And Nick is saying he needs to be stopped at all costs. No matter what it takes, he needs to be stopped. And and, and Nikki's saying, uh, you know, I just want to get him. I want to get him, you know, revenge. And then uh, Dylan and Avery want him stopped. And, um, you know, Dylan... Well, first of all, again, I really, I can't see how this is not leading toward a Who Killed Ian Ward storyline. I mean, it feels like it got put on hold for a little bit, and now it's bumped back up. Anytime every character in Genoa City is saying, I'm going to kill him, oh, I could just kill him, oh, that guy deserves to be killed, you know, <laughs> he's going to get killed. <laughs> so, I, 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 I kind of hope not, I mean, well, I definitely hope not, but the, the scene where Dylan is so upset by what just happened where that he he tra basically trashes the coffee house he goes into work i think ian had just paid a visit to him or something and the second ian leaves the door dylan starts smashing everything he takes countertops and just wipes them away he's like knocking tables over like a child this really was, did not endear me to Dylan. As I'm watching him throw stuff over, I thought, he looks like a little boy. You know, if you've ever seen a little child throw a temper tantrum, that's exactly what it looked like. He seemed like a little boy who could not handle his emotions. The only thing that he could do was to just destroy and knock things over. And it really turned me off of him. I mean, believe me, I am a big child in a lot of ways. Look at me. But I have never thrown something in anger. I cannot think of one single instance where I would throw it. I cannot imagine what the situation would be where I would throw something. Like, I mean, I guess I'm, it's, I'm a girl. Maybe it's different for guys. But just never. It, it would never occur to me. And to see this big explosive reaction where he's getting physical, it just, it, it, it didn't look good. And it makes him look like the one who's going to kill Ian. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if Ian fakes his, yeah, that's probably it. He's probably going to fake his own death. I'm blaming on Dylan and everybody else. He's got an end game here, and we haven't seen the end of it. Mm-hmm. <sighs> so, after the injunction gets filed, uh, Nikki leaves the Baldwins. She goes to a bar. Oh, yes. She sits right down and tells the bartender she would like a vodka martini. And she says it in full consciousness of what she's doing. She knows what she's doing. She came there to get a drink. She orders the drink. She's getting ready to drink the drink. Except sure enough, <laughs> just as she brings the glass to her lips, Devon walks in and we'll talk about why Devon was at that bar a little bit later. It's like the naughty bar. It's like the bar where everybody goes to do things they shouldn't be doing. But <laughs> Nikki does manage to skirt her way out of there without drinking. Now, meanwhile, Chris and Paul having a lovely vacation at a cabin. They're fishing. They're doing puzzles. <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting, let me tell you. <laughs> um, actually, I thought it was very cute. I really enjoyed seeing Paul and Christine ha having a lovely time and enjoying each other and laughing and just being 
comfortable. It was something we haven't seen in a while. There's been so much strife, especially after Paul got shot and all of that. So many tears. It was really nice to just see them kind of chilling out not doing much. It didn't last long and a lot of it was because Chris decided to hide Paul's cell phone. She uh, didn't want Paul to be very aware of anything that was going on with Ian Ward even though she couldn't help all of it. I, you know, I, I, I think Christine is being very, very protective of Paul but she's being protective of her own interests too, let's be real. Ugh. After Nikki leaves the bar, she cannot get a hold of Victor. So, Nikki goes all the way up to the cabin to find Paul. Christine's out gathering berries or something, and there's a knock on the door, and Paul goes to answer it, and it's Nikki, and she's saying, oh, thank God I found you. I, I, I just need to talk to someone. You know, I gotta tell you everything that's going on. She, she just unloads all over him, and I thought, she just crashed their vacation, and it's totally, totally inappropriate. Is it just me? But I thought, you know, Nikki, I understand what you're going through. I really do. But at the same time, even though you need a friend and I don't want to deny you help, you need to find somebody besides Paul to be support for this. Why not go to the kids or a, a support group or something? Why do you have to go to Paul? Why do you have to hunt him down on vacation to drop your problems on him? I mean, at the end of the day, if it affects Dylan, it does affect Paul. But can you not give the guy a little bit of a break? I can't. They, how long were they on vacation? It can't have been that long. It just seemed inappropriate to me. And furthermore, Nikki knows that this is going to cause a problem with Christine. She knows it and she just doesn't care. I'm telling you guys, the look on Christine's face when she comes back to that cabin and sees Nikki and Paul embracing, <laughs> I think she was thinking, ugh, is there a shotgun anywhere in this cabin? Kevin is still under arrest and being held in uh, for grabbing that hospital badge, and he is essentially hyperventilating in, you know, at the thought of having to go into his cell. He's begging Michael, please don't, please do something. I can't go back into the cell. You have to help me for the hundred millionth billionth time. I really don't like being confined, yet I also can't help committing crimes. <laughs> Uh, Michael has to go to Nikki's trial, so he has to leave um, leave Kevin alone, but he does have a backup plan. <laughs> Who should enter into the police station to save the day? Mommy dearest. <laughs> Gloria returns. How fabulous is she? I just, I loved her so much. Her hair needs a little more length on it. It was too short. But I love her so much. <laughs> She just says, baby, I'm here for you. She adjusts her lipstick, says, who's in charge around here? <laughs> and then she sets her sights straight on. Detective Harding walks right up to him. She just, like, grabs his badge, and she's talking to him and looking at him with love eyes like he's Detective Chavez. And she says, you know, the reason that Chavez left town was because of me. He was, you know, broken hearted over not being able to have me, <laughs> so he had to leave town. <laughs> oh, it was so good. I laughed so much at that, and also I appreciated the fact that somebody acknowledged that Chavez left town. I'm going to choose to believe that that's why he left town, because he just was so broken hearted over not having Gloria. It was so Ugh, it was so good. I mean, how many women just blatantly use their sexuality like that? It was so over the top. It was so deliciously Gloria. Uh, Kevin is just sitting back the entire time mortified. <laughs> like, I'd rather be in a holding cell than witness this. <laughs> but Gloria's just really buttering him up, buttering Harding up, saying, oh, you, you must let me touch your guns. <laughs> 
touching on his arms. She is like so super like sexual with him, but also saying, you know, my son couldn't have done this. You know, my son's a good boy. He's a good boy and he's been helping people here and, and you know, meanwhile rubbing up on him. I mean, she's on him so much. It sends him like running back into the office. He like probably closed the door and locked it behind him. Like, I gotta get away from this crazy woman. <laughs> Uh, but he comes out about a minute later and he miraculously tells Kevin he's released. Mm. Apparently, uh, Christine decided not to press charges was the implication, which is also ridiculous. So they just decided not to press charges on him for stealing, for impersonating a doctor, stealing a badge and hacking into their system. I mean, that's definitely a punishable offense, but I guess they couldn't prove it. Uh, I suppose that's the the end result of that. So, um, Kevin's off the hook for this one, too. <laughs> Add that to the list. <laughs> um, he, Kevin's real unhappy. He doesn't know what to do with his life. I think he has not really allowed himself to process what happened to Delia. When Delia died, Kevin was so focused on helping Chloe get over it that I don't think he really acknowledged how he was feeling. Um, additionally, Chloe left him and she was a big part of his identity and now I don't think he quite knows who he is. Uh, he feels um, conflicted working for the you know, the, the good guys when there's a part of him that wants to be a bad guy. And uh, I think he justifies his negative actions as saying, well, I'm going to do bad things, but I'm going to do it for the good. You know, the Robin Hood. He's a Robin Hood of, of the internet. And so he, he is really struggling, I think, to find out who he is and his identity. And I don't think he really wants to work at the police station anymore. I mean, uh, Detective Harding is clearly uh, his enemy. So Kevin doesn't want to be there. He's blowing off work and he goes to the coffee house and he runs into Mariah. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I mean, they actually have some things in common. They both like to bend the rules a little bit. Um, and they both read the same books. They like quoted something from the same book. And I, I think that the two actors had a really good acting rapport too. They seemed comfortable with one another. I, I, I really enjoyed that interaction and I wonder if that's going to develop into a friendship, possibly even a relationship. I don't know. I'm kind of open to it. I, I, could, I could be down for that. Um, Kevin goes back to the police station and I guess inspired by that interaction with Mariah, he starts writing something like talking about um the how it was like basically the enemy and how he wants to be the hero and your badge can't protect you from this or that or i can't remember the exact text but he starts writing something that seems like i don't know i couldn't tell is it is it a not is he writing a like fiction is he writing a story? Is he trying to get in touch with his writing st st side, his inner artist? Or was he keeping a journal? I, I'm not sure. Not sure exactly what Kevin is up to right now. Um, but with the way that Michael is keeping a hawk eye on him, I'm wondering if whatever it is that Kevin's up to is going to have an impact on the Baldwin family and Michael and Lauren. Michael and Lauren had some really nice, quiet, sexy, funny time this week. They've had so much going on in their lives over the last couple of months and it was nice to see them just having banter and comfort and, and sexy time and Lauren showing her new lingerie and or wanting to and Michael falling asleep, waking up the next morning and saying, no, I missed all of the lingerie related activities. <laughs> uh, it was very, very cute. But I also started thinking, um, Connor called and left me a voicemail this past week and said, you know, there did seem like there was something on Michael's mind during those scenes. And then me adding in the layer of Kevin, I wonder if there is some level, somehow, some type of trouble on the horizon for the Baldwins. Wow. Wow, wow, wowie wow. So, Mariah definitely <laughs> wants Nick.
she she definitely has a crush on Nick. Um, I am so shocked. Uh, Sharon is out of town this week, so Nick and Mariah are at the house alone together, and she is questioning Nick, questioning Faith about Nick's favorite things. Uh, you know what what does he like to eat? Oh, peach pie. I'll give him a peach pie. <laughs> Oh Lord! <laughs> then she like is making she's making him dinner. She's doing all these chores around the house, and she's making sure she's wearing a tight little shirt, tight little tank top, tight little shorts while she's doing it. I'm shocked. Okay, first of all, I'm shocked, but second of all, I I kind of love it. And uh, let me tell, but don't get mad at me because let me tell you why. <laughs> it's just like. It's sensational. It's unexpected. Like, like, let me be clear though. I'm all for Mariah having a crush on Nick. I mean, Nick's a very crushable guy. She has no connection to him. She's not Cassie. She's trying real hard this week to establish she's not Cassie. If Nick were to return the feelings in any way, I would be anti. I would be so uh, like, no, no, I'd be, I'd be, believe me, I would be the leader of that train. But I, I just, I wasn't expecting her to start crushing on Nick and maybe even getting a little obsessed with him. And I just, I love it because it's it's unexpected and it's different and it's a little bit twisted. And I, maybe that's, maybe that describes me. I don't know. <laughs> it's just, I would love to meet the writer who just is sitting at a meeting one time and just says, you know, oh, let's hook him up. Let's see. Let's give her a crush on Nick. I know I would like to meet that twisted writer. Whoever came up with that idea because it's just, wow. I really like it. <laughs> you guys gotta tell me how you feel about it. I mean, open yourself up a little bit at least for being shocked. You know, I don't like the same old predictable stuff. It was not predictable. Therefore, I like it. <laughs> so Sharon comes home from her trip and she sees Mariah there in her tight clothes cleaning up and she's saying oh what's going on here you need some new um you need some new clothes I think it doesn't even occur to Sharon that Mariah might actually be trying to move in on her man Sharon still sees Mariah as like Cassie. I mean, if these are truly two completely different people, then there's no reason to project any of the good qualities that Cassie had onto Mariah. But Sharon wants to believe in this girl. And I, I do think it's unhealthy for Sharon because if she didn't happen to look exactly like Cassie, would Sharon really be going out of her way? I don't think so. And I think Nick knows that, and he's trying to protect her from that. Um, but he's needing to protect himself. Sharon offers to get Mar give, get Mariah a new dress, buying her new clothes. So what does she do? She goes to the boutique, which like is probably the most expensive place to buy a dress, and she buys this tight black dress. She goes to work at the underground, and she tries to use it to gain some more tips for the evening. And Nick puts the stop to that immediately. He says, No, 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 no takes one look at her, tells her to put back on that baggy black underground tea. <laughs> you will not be serving drinks in that dress, young lady. <laughs> I'm sure that she was hoping that Nick would um, tell her to take the dress off, but in a different way. <laughs> oh, man. So that kind of got sidelined a little bit for a moment because Mariah... I don't know if it was on a break or something. She takes a phone call. It's her mother. And Nick overhears her talking, saying, you know, Le you know, whatever, mom. <laughs> Said something, something, mom. And Nick's like, wait a minute. You lied to Sharon. You lied to us. You said that your mother was dead. And Mariah comes back and gives this impassioned speech about how her mother abandoned her, was never really there for her, would leave her for weeks and months at a time, only calls when she needs something like money. And so um, she's, you know, says, I felt like my mother was dead to me. And so I did and I didn't want to talk about it. So I just said that she's dead. And uh, Nick, I don't think he, I think he, is not as easily swayed by her sad story as Sharon is. You know, Nick uh, Nick wants to tell Sharon. He, in fact, later does tell Sharon that Mariah's been lying again. And Sharon immediately wants to give her a second chance. Nick doesn't 
doesn't just automatically assume that she's as good as Cassie was. So Nick goes to, does an internet search and he types in the, Mariah's mother's name, which is Helen Copeland. And I, this is what, I wanted to bring, bring this one first full circle because there is a part of me that is wondering if there's any chance Mariah's mother could somehow be connected to or somehow be construed as Ian's secret weapon because after the trial Ian was saying you know I've got one more ace up my sleeve and I don't know I'm wondering if the tabloid thing wasn't it I mean Ian insists that he didn't do it didn't leak the story maybe he did maybe he didn't but it doesn't seem big enough you know I think Ian's got something bigger planned and I wonder if uh, Mariah's mother is connected to that I feel like I read that she was cast but I don't know I don't remember. Maybe she was. But, um, so ugh, later in the week, Sharon is, uh, or I'm sorry, no, Victor is at the athletic club. He runs into Sharon's therapist and begins to question her and the therapist does the right thing and says, I'm not going to disclose anything Sharon told me to you. Uh, but Sharon walked in, saw him there, saw it as a, a, a breach of her trust and she decided to fire her therapist the creepy therapist fired her right on the spot i was glad because she creeps me out <laughs> but and then it kind of dawned on me <sighs> mariah did reveal this week that her mom the last thing she knows about her mom was that she was a nurse in kentucky is there any chance that Sharon's therapist could be Mariah's mom? Just very quickly, because I don't care that much. Um, <laughs> Summer and Austin are having their, you know, sort of they're in their honeymoon period. Austin sets up this very sweet tropical honeymoon for her in the apartment since they can't really go anywhere because you know he's like getting ready to be on trial they can't probably leave the state or the country so he sets up this sort of um tropical honeymoon at home in the apartment i am not saying it's not sweet uh i i think that i'm i'm sure austin could be redeemable i'm sure it's i'm just not there yet i could get there but i'm just i'm not there right now so bear with me the um trial is coming up he has to reveal to summer that he the court date's been set he's gonna be on trial he wanted to give her this honeymoon so that they can make as many positive memories as they can before he goes away to prison and Every single time that Austin mentions the trial or mentions that he might possibly go to prison or that he thinks he will go to prison, Summer does this equivalent of sticking her fingers in her ears and going, la 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 la, I don't want to hear about it, I don't want to think about it, and it's not healthy. It is, in fact, very difficult to watch. You're not connected with reality here, Summer. The, I understand that you're wanting to seize the moment. That I get. But putting your fingers in your ears and covering your eyes and refusing to acknowledge the reality of the situation is very, very immature. And I, I just, every time I, I watch this happen, I just think, ah, oh, Summer is coming off to me so desperate, like, like, a, like a little girl trying so hard to hold on to her dolly. I love every single catty encounter between Hillary and Lily. It's it's all very um, you know predictable. Um, Hillary actually fights back and throws a drink on Lily this week. Oh, she had to Lily it, her, got her dress ruined and she had to go buy a new one from the boutique. Your father's rich. Your brother's a billionaire. I mean, what's the big deal? You had to buy a new dress. I mean, uh, you pushed Hillary in the pool and publicly humiliated her, and you had to buy a new dress. Hmm. <laughs> I love it. It's rife with hypocrisy, but it's exactly the right amount of daytime cat fight that I like to have. I feel bad for Kane. This poor guy is at the end of his rope. He's tired of the rivalry that's going on between Lily and Hillary. He is the only one besides Devon and Hillary that really knows what's going on. He unfortunately is in this horrible position of having to keep a secret from his father-in-law that his new wife is in love with his son. <laughs> it's 
not a good place to be in, and I just wanted to make sure I mention, I think Cain is going to end up paying a big price for his silence when all of this comes out. Because Lily's not going to be happy with him, Neil's not going to be happy with him, nobody's going to be happy with him. I think Cain's heart is in the right place, just trying not to cause waves, trying to hope that the Hillary and Devon thing fizzles out, but it's it's... It's clear that he's, I think Kane's going to take a lot of heat for this. Um, now, at the end, I guess, of, of you know where last we left off, it, it, it sort of has flipped. Devon has been having a hard time getting over Hillary, but he is becoming resolved. Maybe I will try to move on or at least try to date other people. And, and just as that's kind of happening in him, Hillary is coming around that night that they shared um, overnight at the car that really flipped her switch and now she's wanting Devon she actively realizes that she wants him but and, I, and Devon wants her but he is trying a little bit to move on or at least try to play the part like he's dating Lily has been trying to push he and Abby together so he decides to uh, clear out the entire rooftop bar for this date he orders like all the fine of everything but beluga caviar I know nothing about that but apparently it's the best caviar <laughs> and he had it I'm sure Abby Newman is used to only the best so they're having you know Devon and Abby are having this you know, little date and they're getting along but they're both clearly thinking about other people Abby's not really ready to move on from Tyler and there's only one woman that Devon has the deep heated sticky lust for. <laughs> and, and the next day, Devon is going for a jog in the park. He runs into Hillary and she's real combative. She's saying, you know, oh, well, your new girlfriend, does she know that you're stalking me? And she just keeps throwing out all of these remarks uh, indicating that she saw Devon and Abby together on their date and that she's obviously jealous about it. I, I, it was really again also kind of immature hillary made her choice to marry neil to stay with neil so why can't devon make his choice to move on if that's what he really wants which he doesn't they have another interaction another conversation and this one was a little bit different though for the first time hillary started to admit that she actually does have feelings for Devon too, and it's active. I mean, it, it's it's not just in the back of her mind, it's now moved to the front of her mind, and she said, I, I kissed my husband and I thought of you, and I hate myself for this. I hate myself, well, I don't know if she specifically said that, but she said, of all of the horrible things that I've done in my life, this feels like the worst that I could betray Neil in this way somebody who has cared for me and done so much for me I hate that I'm doing this to him and Devon doesn't Devon I don't see remorse from him I see that Devon has a one track mind there is one thing he wants and it's Hillary and it doesn't matter that she's married to his father it's a it's it's really immoral and I was very mad at Devon because as she admits this, it's clear that he's getting like turned on and excited about it. He's like, oh, she finally does love me. Oh, I gotta, gotta act on this, gotta do this, gotta strike, I gotta get what I want. At any cost, I gotta get what I want. And he tells Hillary, there's this little bar that I go to on the outskirts of town when I wanna get away. I'm gonna give you the address. I want you to meet me there. And Hillary's like, like for what? <laughs> and he says, if you don't meet me there, I'm gonna leave town. It, it's, it's emotionally manipulative. Hillary wants to do it, but by, but by adding that extra, if you don't meet me, if you don't meet me for a rendezvous, which well, this is what it is, because you're not gonna tell your husband about it, if you don't meet me for a rendezvous, I'm gonna leave town, which Hillary knows Neil doesn't want, Lily doesn't want, so it's she feels like responsible for keeping him in the family, but also it's a good excuse because she really wants him too. But it just, I didn't like it because it seemed to me as soon as the words came out of De Devon's mouth, meet me at a private location, it started sounding like, I wanna schedule this affair. Let's, let's schedule this affair. <laughs> 
I really didn't like it. I, 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 he, they they kind of leave it as, Hillary, you decide whether or not, I'm going to be there, Devon says, I'm going to be there. You decide whether or not you want to meet me there. And she goes and she ends up uh, having a, a, a little uh, luncheon or something with Neil and she's chatting with him. And Neil's blissfully unaware. He's trying to get ready this house that he's bought for her, wants to surprise her with it, and she is feeling nothing but guilt. She's like, ugh, I don't deserve any of this. And Neil's telling her, yes, you do. You deserve everything and more. And the, the scene, the final kind of scene between Hillary and Neil of the week was so touching on his part. Not only does Neil love her, but he forgave her for everything that she did to him and his family. He fought for her when no one else did. When everyone else wanted to turn her away and chase her out of Genoa City, Neil kept, supported her. He gave her a job, he gave her a support system, and then he took her in to his apartment, he started dating her, and then he married her. Neil has shown her unconditional love and understanding and what is she doing in return that's why she hates herself she should feel the way she ha she does she let it go too far it's okay to not love neil it's okay to not love neil like that but you lied you lied to yourself hillary that's the bigger problem i think so they have this wonderful moment together and then uh devon goes off to the bar Waits to see if Hillary's gonna show up, and oh yes she does. <sighs> when she walked in the door, <laughs> the look on Devon's face was acquisition. I, I just, maybe I've got, uh, I'm feeling negative about it, but the look on Devon's face to me said, I went, I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna get what I want, yes. And they, I mean, he's elated. They, they, the second they come together, they embrace immediately before they said anything. They just embrace. Oh, this is a private spot. Oh, we can do this here finally. We don't have to hide it. They embrace. Oh. <laughs> and for the first time, they both admit they love each other. Well, Devon said it before, but Hillary's, I love you know, I love you. So they sit down. And they decide that they're going to tell Neil everything. They're not going to approach it like an affair, which was the one good thing about it. Because I really did think, ooh, if they just decide to have this affair, that is uncool. <laughs> Real uncool. It's all uncool anyway. But that's especially uncool. So they did decide they're going to tell Neil before anything goes any further. They're going to meet with him, like, right now. Right now, though, Neil is at the house that he's just bought. He was there with Kane a little bit earlier, and there's an electrical problem, and Neil asks Kane to go out and help fix it, and Kane's able to do a temporary fix, and then he can't wait to get the hell out of there. Kane does not even want to have to be in the same room with Neil, because he knows he's lying to him. And so Kane leaves, Neil's at the house alone, and the lights start to flicker again, and Neil... <laughs> He sticks his he goes to the to the fuse box, sticks his hand in there. It's dark, like it's pitch black, and Neil's rooting around in this electrical box. I mean, I'm kind of loud. You might as well have done it with a fork, Neil. You might as well have gone to the kitchen and grabbed a fork <laughs> and started rooting around in the electrical box right there. Because of course he gets shocked. There's a big shoom, spark. He falls to the floor. I'm like, how did this man? get to be a successful executive and not know not to stick his finger in a light socket. <laughs> I mean, proverbially, of course, but I mean, it's the equivalent. Really, Neil? <laughs> uh, you know he's going to be passed out on the floor when Hillary and Devon go to find him. They're going to find him somehow. He's going to be passed out on the floor. May I don't know, maybe Kane will find him. I don't know who will find him, but I watched a preview for next week's show. And Neil is um, in the hospital. Ugh, the family has been informed. Lily is blaming Hillary for everything. I, I mean, and they're all, let's see, Lily, Hillary, Kane, they seem like they're all there. Devon, uh, Lily is lashing out at Hillary, saying this is all your fault. Hillary's feeling guilty anyway, so she's going to take that blame. She's going to accept that Lily, what Lily's saying is true, and she's going to wear it, and then... They're, they're, and then Hillary and Devon are going to talk and decide not to tell Neil. 
So, just to prepare you, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you what your next two weeks are gonna be like, and why not? <laughs> Maybe three. I don't know, but here it is. Get ready for it. It's gonna be more longing looks <laughs> between Hillary and Devon. It's gonna be more stolen moments between Hillary and Devon. It is just delaying the inevitable. <laughs> I'm, I don't know. It's, it gets me talking, gets me riled up, so therefore I like it. As someone who ha you know, talks about YNR every week, I like that. Just like as a passive viewer and you know, me making a moral judgment on it, I don't like it. But, um, but yeah, I, I, there's actually going to be a... Uh, I was on the CBS website and I saw that there's going to be a live chat with Christoph St. John Neal and uh, Brighton James Devon. There's going to be a live chat on the CBS website on Thursday. <clears throat> it was at 12.30 Eastern, 9.30 Pacific, if anybody's interested in logging in there and live chatting. Um, if you do, <laughs> be sure to... Somebody needs to get in there, and they need to start questioning these people about what they think about the storyline. I want somebody to ask Neil what he's going to do with that big old house once his marriage blows apart. To ask him that on behalf of YNR Chat. <laughs> I sincerely bet as soon as Neil finds out about, the, about all of this, I'm pretty sure he is going to wish that that house would burn to the ground. It's time for comments! <laughs> I did an abbreviated chat last week because it was not feeling well and I didn't end up getting to any comments. Um, so I'm giving you extra long way in our chat this week and a lot of comments. Now this is not all of them because I was trying to kind of look looking back through two weeks and plucking some out. Um, but I did get a lot of good comments. Please don't be offended if yours isn't included. Um, I read everything and I, there was a lot of good ones this week. But uh, I got got to hit the high, my, my ones that were kind of relevant to what I was talking about today. Um, well, first of all, actually, last week, Gary had called into my voicemail, had mentioned two times about um, a scene last week at Victoria's house where they had the Emmy sitting on the, the mantle. Amelia Heinel had won the daytime Emmy, and I guess as a little bit of a Easter egg, a little bit of a nod, they had the Emmy sitting, sitting on the mantle at, at her house. And I think in one other place, too. I didn't see it. I'm really sorry, Gary. I didn't see it. I was like, as soon as I heard you say it, I was like, that is, that's genius. I actually like it a lot. I, I like little things like that. Um, I just wasn't feeling good last week, and I did a lot of kind of listening to YNR. And <laughs> I was not as observant as I should have been, and I'm sorry that I missed that. Did anybody else see it? Have to um, leave a comment and let me know, because I think that's pretty cool. Um, Ellen left me a comment at yrchat.com, and she says, Isn't it funny the way Stitch just stands there slack-jawed with nothing to say for himself while people call him a cold-blooded killer? The poor actor just has to stand there looking frustrated. Yeah, I have noticed that. Uh, the only new information I heard this week was when Kelly mentioned her mother. She said it was hard to forgive her mother because she was on Ben's side immediately after the murder, the quote-unquote murder. Uh, Kelly said her mom was just all about Ben right afterward. Do you think that it was the mother who killed the drunk, abusive father and Ben just took the blame to protect his mother and now he still has to keep his mouth shut in order to keep her out of trouble? I think that would be one way to redeem Stitch, our selfless hero and caring physician. Oh, yes, Ellen. Oh, yes. I think that's probably it because I was getting that exact same feeling if you remember back a couple of weeks even when Stitch was having his prayer time in the hospital saying to God you understand why I did what I did so it was not an accident it didn't just accidentally hit over a lantern and the guy went and then dad went up in in flames and became charred no Stitch did something and he has not admitted that I've seen to like cold-blooded murdering I think I heard Stitch say it was an accident and then anytime anybody questioned him further about it he just kind of skirts around the issue and stands there looking slack-jawed. So he's covering up for somebody and Victoria said this week there's more to the story. So my initial thought was is there any chance that Stitch is covering up for Kelly, something Kelly did? But this is better, Ellen. This is better. This is very, very possible that he was covering up for the mother and maybe Kelly doesn't know that. So maybe that is a good way to redeem Stitch because if he 
if something, if the whole thing went down and it was an effort to protect his mother from something horrible that the father was doing, then it's, I mean, I don't know if it's quote unquote justified, but it's more redeemable. And then if Kelly was totally in the dark about all this and hated her brother over this for many, many years and Stitch never once, I mean, Kelly destroyed his marriage and Stitch never once said, I was protecting our mother. <laughs> That's what's gonna happen. This is gonna happen. This is genius. I love it. I, I, it's, I, get, I get like a little satisfaction from from uh, you guys figuring out what's gonna happen before it happens. I, I, that there, I really think that's it. Um, Charmed Nick on Twitter says, funny how Victoria and the rest of the town is so down on Stitch, but they seem to forget that Nikki is also a murderer. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You could probably count on one hand all the people in Genoa City who are not murderers. <laughs> it's very true. They are very judgmental. Um, Bobby Thompson uh, sent me a Facebook message and said, Dylan is such a spaz. Tearing his coffee part up, tearing his coffee house apart? I would be nervous if I were Avery. Well, I thought the same thing, Bobby. There is something about Dylan being so violent all of the time that is unsettling aside from the fact that I find it childish yeah yeah if I'm putting myself in Avery's shoes if my man was destroying stuff I'm I assume that they're you know kind of wanting to get married someday which would make me think is he gonna do this to our house sometime let's take out the element of I don't think Dylan would ever hurt Avery but Let's say you're living together or you're married someday. Would you ever let your husband just destroy the house? Like, it's a red flag. What if that happens at home? If he's willing to destroy the coffee house, could he be willing to destroy things at home? How, if he's willing to be violent in X situation, what? why wouldn't he be violent in Y situation? Do you know what I'm saying? So, uh, yeah, I don't know, it makes me uncomfortable. I think Dylan's character, well, you know, Wander spent a number of months of making Dylan the nicest guy in the world. Oh, he's such a, he's everything, he's great, great, great. And now they're bringing him down. And I do think that that is probably needed. I think people maybe needed to dislike Dylan a little bit. Mission accomplished. <laughs> this week I'm not liking him as much. Um, Rock, I've never said, I've seen this username a million times. I've never said it out loud, I don't think. Rocks, 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 Grace. <laughs> on YouTube. I think it's one of like the oldest one or chat of yours um, on, on YouTube. Rocks, 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 Grace says, oh, by the way, Allie, there's a, uh, uh, oh, no, 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 no. Let me, let me read that one second. No, I'll read it first. There's a small group of us on board <laughs> the ha hashtag harder train. Harding Fisher, if you want to jump in. <laughs> so um, apparently, there's a a, a, a movement um, the, uh, to to get uh, Detective Harding and Kevin Fisher into a, a, a love a love uh, uh, relationship. I think that's um, that would be that would be some uh, compelling controversial TV. I'm, I'm in. I like controversy. It gives me something to talk about. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there is a lot of tension there. You gotta admit. If you guys are, there's a hashtag here. So if you're interested in that, do hashtag harder. <laughs> oh, that makes me laugh. Hashtag harder and then do an at Allie's YR chat. <laughs> Let me know if you're on board for that. I suppose you could do that on Facebook too. Um, now, as, again, on the Kevin issue, Jay Bird left a message on YouTube saying, my least favorite character and storylines are those that have to do with Kevin Fisher. He really asks for trouble and then seems to think that the world is against him when he gets caught with his hands in the proverbial cookie jar. What a weirdo. However, Michael plays the role of a caring brother and always has his back. It's very fair. It's a very fair observation, Jay Bird. Um, Kevin always does seem to get away with it. I, although, I guess if I'm given the choice between naughty Kevin and boring Kevin Chloe Metro sexual Kevin, I just, I'd, I'd almost, I'd rather have the bad Kevin, I guess. Um, maybe, yeah, I'm wondering where they're going with him. I, I think they've got a plan for Kevin. It's just not quite revealed yet. So maybe he'll, maybe he'll step it up and... Uh, give us something interesting to talk about. Uh, hashtag harder. <laughs> or if you don't want uh, that, you should uh, hashtag not harder and then at 
Allie's YR chat and let me know. Um, okay, about uh, Sharon and Phyllis here. Now, this was very interesting to me. Karen Ferguson left a comment on YouTube uh, in, in uh, response to a point that I made last week about hypnosis. You know how I feel about hypnosis storylines. And I asked, you know, is this even still something that doctors do? Do they still do hypnosis? And Karen Ferguson says on YouTube, clinical hypnosis is actually real and it's even recognized by the American Psychological Association. It's often used to help people traumatized, like for instance PTSD or rape, um, learn how to relax and escape from the lingering terror and to help them face their fears in a doctor's office where they can learn that they're safe. It's used by psychiatrists who have medical degrees. It's untrue that anyone can be made to do something under hypnosis that they wouldn't do in real life. Sorry Manchurian candidate. So that's interesting i think that, that was kind of a a little um a little educational fyi so i'm glad that you said that that's good um henry on twitter finally uh last comment says hi ali i'm anxiously awaiting gina tognani's debut on august 11th as phyllis time is about up sharon just ask victor yes i I'm pretty excited about it too. August 11th, that's tomorrow. So if you're in Canada, you've already seen it. And oh, I'm really looking forward to that on Monday show. I, I saw, just while I was on the CBS website, I just briefly saw a photo of her and I think she was posing with Summer, I wanna say, and I, I buy it already. I mean, I don't know what the actress's um, like vibe is gonna be, but physically, she kind of looks the part. To me, she's probably quite a bit, she looks a little younger, uh, and uh, you know, oh my gosh. I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's gonna be good, and it's also especially gonna be good that Phyllis is basically coming out of this coma at exactly the point that Jack is deciding to move on with Kelly. Okay, everybody, <laughs> that was a long one. If you're still here, bless you. <laughs> Thanks for sticking with me all the way to the end. That's pretty awesome. I should have a hashtag for that, too. Hashtag, um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, hashtag, oh, I don't know. I've lost my creativity after like an hour and a half. I've got nothing left. Uh, just let me know you made it to the end of the video if you made it to the end of the video. <laughs> and come back next week because we're going to talk about explosive whip, kneel, sparks flying, shoop, <laughs> and we're going to talk about new Phyllis. So next week should be a really, really good one. So definitely check back with me. Please feel free to leave me a comment because I may very well read them uh, on the next YNR chat. You can leave it on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. You can go to my website at yrchat.com. You could leave a voicemail. million different ways that you can get a hold of me. So please, please let me know what your thoughts are about the show. I love you. As always, you guys. Everybody have a good week and I'll see you next Sunday. Bye!